Good morning. Welcome to Fleshing Out Your Characters. Um, on this session, there are a couple things to note first. One, um, we're going to do Q&A beginning at about uh, 30 minutes after the hour. So please put your questions in the Q&A section and your comments in the chat. Immediately after the session, uh, a couple of us will be going to the Discord uh, channel, uh, chat channel to follow up. Go to the writing uh, channel and we're happy to continue with uh, following up on some of the questions brought up by today. Uh, lastly, um, Balticon really appreciates donations to help with the expenses of uh, being virtual. So please consider making a donation online. They'd really appreciate it. Okay, now I'm going to introduce myself for a moment. I'm D.H. Ayer, your moderator. I'm the author of uh, 19 books. The most recent is a novella called Nowhere to Go But Mars. Um, I am reachable at uh, dhair.net to learn more about me and my books. Um, I'm now going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, and I'm going to start with Kim. Hi there, I'm Kim Hargan. I am a retired professional alien. Um, I served the American people for 28 years as a U.S. diplomat, and so as a U.S. citizen, wherever the U.S. government sent me, I was an alien there, and that made me a professional alien, and I am now retired, and I write science fiction, and I will click in a moment, and you can see where to find this uh, on Amazon.com. It's the story of um, an interstellar contract insurance investigator trained in an alien martial art that serves him well when he runs into people who don't want to cooperate, and I like panels. Karen. Uh, hello, I'm Karen Warren. I'm an Australian writer, uh, so it's midnight where I am. Uh, I write uh, mostly horror. My latest is this uh, novella called Into Bones Like Oil, um, which was amazingly made the Stoker shortlist, which is very cool, um, inspired. And this one's got lots and lots of characters. The reason I wanted to come on this panel is it's uh, set in a rooming house, so it's full of main characters and not so main characters. Cerise. Hi everyone, I'm Cerise Rennie Murphy. I'm a science fiction, fantasy, and children's book author. And my latest uh, book is a duology actually called The Wolf Queen, about a young woman who discovers she's part of an ancient legacy of sorcerers. And um, there are lots of supporting characters that I really enjoyed creating. So that's why I'm here. Ted. Hi, I'm Ted Weber. I'm a speculative fiction author, among other things. Uh, the first two books of my near future cyberpunk trilogy, um, Sleep State Interrupt and Wrath of Leviathan, uh, were published by C Sharp Press and can be found online. And the finale will be released September 1st. And uh, they have an ensemble cast, kind of like Ocean's Eleven, which is why I guess I'm here. Um, and the main cast of the first book is behind me. Um, I've also done character workshops for two of the chapters of the Maryland Writers Association, and um, the slides and the recommended reading are online, as well as a sample character development sheet, and I'll post a link to those in the chat. Perfect. Okay, so the first question I want to pose to the panel is, so you've come up with an amazingly detailed and interesting main character. What about everybody else? So um, let's start from with Karen. First, <laughs> um, when, so when I was thinking about this, um, I was thinking that it's a bit like having your large cast of secondary characters. It's a bit like the Chekhov's gun for people. So any character that appears, even in a slight way, has to show up a little bit later on and there's there's another reason for them being there. Um, in fiction anyway, like in, in movies, of course, you can have people in the background and they're just there for the background. Uh, but in fiction, and especially in short fiction, you need to have a secondary reason why each of those characters is there. So if you, if you put someone in the first scene, you've got to have maybe at least one more reason why they're there um, later on. And so to justify doing that, you need to give them a little bit more uh, life and background than you otherwise might think you, as you need to. Okay. Um, let me go to Cerise. 
Um, you know, I think about it like, what does the main character need to learn? Because every, just like in life, you learn things through interaction with others. So all of your supporting cast are there to essentially teach your main character what they need to learn to get to help complete their arc. And so even if it's a piece of information, if it's, um, you know, a philosophy, if it's um, an aspirational thing where they're looking at this supporting character and realizing, oh, I would like to be more like that. Um, all of that plays into, then tells you who you need to have on this journey. Um, and then you start, but they're not just there to be like, hi, you need to think more about being brave. I mean, that's not interesting. Nobody wants to read that. So like, why is that character a good person to teach your main character about bravery? That means you have to ask the, answer the question, what do they do? Where are they from? How did they become brave? And all of that then becomes the backstory for this character. And you may allude to that, or you might, the reader might never learn about it at all. But when you know about it, when you spend the time to answer those questions, it informs the dialogue, how they speak, why they use the words they use. And it becomes this incredibly intricate and wonderful process, even though it's just for this sort of, you're here to teach the main character X. Um, and you can have so much fun with that because you don't have to complete their arc. So you literally just get to have a good time with them. Ted. Um, well, the, I guess first off, the longer your story, the more characters typically you're gonna have, not always, but typically. So for a short story, um, you're only gonna have maybe a couple characters maybe maybe a few more but it's, it's going to be minimal whereas um you know novel you're going to have usually a lot of characters and especially um uh, like uh, epic fantasy you may have a cast of thousands so i would group them in um protagonist that's your your main character and you may have more than one protagonist but typically there's only one um, then an antagonist, um, which may or may not be a person. They're not necessarily a villain, but they're just opposed to the protagonist. Then you have your other major characters or your other point of view characters, or other characters with a lot of uh, stage time or page time. And you've got your minor characters that might only appear in just a few scenes, but they're necessary for the plot. Um, and, uh, and then you've got your extras, which only appear once. Uh, and all of these need to at least be memorable in some way. And depending on how much page time they have and how important they are to the plot and the character arcs, that's how much um, the author um, needs to invest in their, their background and their um, character arc. So we can go into more details later. Kim. So I like I like Karen's um, reference to uh, Chekhov's gun over the mantelpiece in a stage play. Um, in my thoughts, uh, I refer to something somebody said in the panel. I believe they uh, referenced uh, Robert Heinlein, in which he said, "You know, as you're going through, you know, rereading your text or whatnot, or even as you're writing it, that a scene has to do one of three things. It has to." move the plot along to develop the character and develop doesn't necessarily mean change it means to, like in photography develop the image of the, the character add to the image of the character in the um in the reader's mind or to import vital information and, and uh, impart excuse me vital information and the scene should at best do at least two of those if not all three and if it doesn't do any of those that really doesn't belong in your story and i'm thinking that as scenes involve characters, characters should be there to either their appearance moves the plot along or the interaction with the protagonist or with other characters, you know, side characters, um, develops our picture of those characters. Or as Sari said, they tell the main character something they needed to know. In my case, you know, my detective is interrogating people. And so he needs to learn something from them. And so, you know, you need to have one of those three things. Otherwise, why is the character even appearing? Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, okay, so that, that's the author's purpose for the character, okay? And 
we often in in, um, in panels talking about writing convincing villains you know, rather than the cardboard mustache twirling snidely whiplash type, um, or if it's not actually a villain but an antagonist, uh, they talk about everybody is a hero in their own story. Mm -hmm. They have their own reasons for doing what they do and for going where they go and all of that. And so, yes, your purpose is to move the plot along, to develop the character, to impart information. But the character should also be passing through on his way to work, or um, he, he sees the the, the protagonist is wearing nice clothes, so he comes up and tries to sell him something, or they're stuck in the elevator together, and so, golly gee, you know, um, you know, we may as well talk. But so there should be, and again, they talked about, uh, I guess Cerise talked about the, the, the side characters having, a, you know, in your own mind, a rich background, in your own mind, they should have their own, their own purpose for being there. Because otherwise, you know, there are these little chess pieces that you move around and uh, the readers can, they can pick up on the fact that, you know, just, you know, what, what's this guy even doing? Could, couldn't this other character have come back and said the same thing? They should have agency. They should have agency. And, and again, they should have a purpose for appearing, their own purpose. Yeah. I was, um, Karen. I was thinking about, um, I loved S.E. Hinton when I was a, a young writer and in her book, uh, That Was Then, This Is Now, there's this amazing moment where the main character is driving along in their car and they look out to the car next to them and the car in front of them, the car behind, and they think they've got lives that are just as big and important as mine, but I know nothing about them. They've got nothing to do with me, but I, but their lives are absolutely their lives, just as important as my life is to me. And I do think about sometimes what would, you, we should be able to jump from our main character's car into one of our side character's car and live their life for a little bit. So, so know them well enough that we could jump into that car and drive off into their story um, as a side, you know, for the side characters as well. So, yeah, remembering that the side characters actually have this whole existence, even if we're not necessarily telling their story. And, and, and because of that, they have their own personalities. They're not all, yeah. you know, appear in their talking heads. They, yes. they're, they're cranky, they're kind, they're compassionate, they're angry. They're whatever it is that drives them at that moment that they appear in the story. So going into my next question, which seems to flow a bit from this, how do you develop a supporting cast with distinctive and new that are nuanced characters to um, build audience investment and fill out your story? Um, is this directed to anyone or should I just jump in? Feel free to jump in, Ted. Uh, well, first of all, all your characters, you know, whether they be um, protagonist, antagonist, major, minor, um, the bit characters you don't really need to worry about so much. Um, they should seem real, like somebody that you know well, or um, as a reader, you start to get to know. Um, and they should be memorable. So some ways that um, you can make them memorable um, is to make them unpredictable, uh, to surprise the reader with their actions. And my favorite is when I'm writing and the, the uh, character surprises me with their actions. Um, that's why I can tell them they've taken on a life of their own. Uh, they should be passionate about something. They should care about something. They should have a, a goal. Even um, even your non-protagonist character, they should all have goals because they're all real people. Real people have uh, something, have goals. Um, to make them memorable, you can have them carry a wound from their past uh, that affects them in the present. So something that happened in their past that... Um, has impacted the way they are today is something maybe something bad um, or something that they can't get out of can't get rid of it affects their psyche now um, uh, characters that are resourceful or courageous um, people will will naturally root for um, and then ones that especially ones that fight for a just cause so these are things that obviously apply to your protagonist but you, there are ways that you can make any character uh, memorable. Okay, who else would like to pick up from there? Cerise, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, if you remember that personality comes from experience, 
I mean, there right. are things you're born with, you're, you're a morning person or a night person. But other than that, your, your life shapes you. So when you think about, after you've decided why this character needs to be there for the story or the, the protagonist, the question is what makes them the person that should deliver this story or tell this thing or do this thing that then drives the plot along? And the answer to that question gets to the personality. So if this person has had a really hard life, but they've had some spark of hope along the way, some support, maybe they are extraordinarily kind, even though they've had a really difficult situation, or maybe they're extraordinarily mean because no one's been nice to them through this hard time and they feel like they don't want to be nice to anybody else. Um, so really thinking deeply about the experiences that have shaped the life of your main character and every character that's in your book helps you understand the personality. So then you can bring that out. Um, yeah, that's what I would add. They have one of those writing rules, you know, write what you know. Um, and as a diplomat, I've uh, encountered a number of languages, spoken them, and noticed how the native patterns that people have in their own language then carry over into when they try to speak English. And in my novel, I've created a, a um, easy communication language. Some, some other alien race created it called interall speak and uh, you know, like Esperanto and everybody speaks it. Well, I, I, I render it as English, you know, for, for the reader, but everybody is speaking interall speak to each other, but some of them speak it, perfectly fluently, but others speak it with strange accents or with uh, strange grammatical patterns, you know, that they can't handle all the complexity or, or something carries over. And there's, that tells you that they're an alien trying to speak this language and it marks them as different from everybody else who speaks in their own ways. I mean, you know, little things like that can pop up and, and, and say, okay, oh, I remember that guy. He was the one that spoke that funny way. You know, a, 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 a character trait that feeds into making somebody a memorable character. Yeah. Linguist. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I really, I just wanted to agree with what you've all said about um, using the background in the past, especially scars, Ted, as you say, physical scars um, and ticks like n a nail biting and that sort of thing um, can really help you just remember, oh, yeah, that's the one that bites nails. Um, I just read a book called The King's General by Daphne du Maurier, which is this really big, fat history um, book. It's an amazing story with hundreds and hundreds of characters. But I realised that one of her tricks was that she would um, describe the character, one, you know, one character would, oh, he's biting his nails as usual. And so you go, oh, yeah, that's that guy. So those little things about reasons why. And quite often I think you read many books and, and films and things, there's someone who does bite their nails down to the quick and you wonder why, what's in their past that's, um, that's caused them to do so. So it's those little details of our, little details of our lives um, that I think are really important and that can easily be described. But also, you know, maybe Cerise, as you said, sometimes we know the answers to those things. We know why they bite their nails, but it doesn't necessarily end up in the story. We just need right. to know yeah. ourselves as the writer so that we have more depth in the story. We don't necessarily have to um, put all that onto the page. Mm. G.R.R. Martin has um, thousands of characters in his books, but they're all, he makes them all memorable. Um, mm. You know, they've all got um, a good side and a bad side. Some of them, it's really like Jeffrey Baratheon, it's very hard to see if he has a good side, but um, they've, they're all very complex uh, characters and memorable. I want to, for, sure. yeah. just in case there are some new writers out there, I want to say something about just how many characters you have. This story has to fit in your pocket, in your brain. <laughs> so if you, I mean, because you can get to the point where there are so many characters, you can't remember them. I have forgotten my characters' names. <laughs> like we, and if you're feeling like it's too big, one of the things I love to do is, I think something that, um, that Karen said, is weave a character back in. So if you need someone, if you're three-fourths through your story and something big is happening and you're thinking you've got to create yet another character, pause. 
who have you already put in there? Who can show up and do this, you know, for you? So the, the story becomes manageable for you. You cannot write a story that cannot fit in your brain. And that's not a bad thing. If that's a two person story, go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. Don't write a story that then gets away from you because you're not going to be able to guide your reader where you want them to go. And that is your job. Mm -hmm. That's important for the reader also. Um, don't overload the reader with tons of characters and character names all at one time because it's too much to handle. Um, please one or two at a time. Um, more than, <laughs> if you like add, uh, if you have like 20 characters in your first chapter, you're going to completely overwhelm the reader. Yeah. I just had uh, a publisher say I had 11 men escaping from jail and she said, no, that's too many, you can have five. Yeah. So, which, and she was exactly right. So I had lots of fun merging all those bad guys together. Um, do you guys do that as well? You end up merging two characters and you kind of realise that, oh, actually, that, that, those two could actually be that one person and it works better. Have you guys done that as well? Yeah. We all have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Particularly when editors say, there's too many people there in that room. Yes. If you had one less person, it would flow better. Mm. Um, That's, so the, can I just ask, or this, I'm, I'm not gonna ask a question now. Um, I've just been thinking about people in the room and how do you keep track of them all and do you have to keep track of them all? You know, if you've got 10 people who've gone into a party, for example, do you have to mm. all the time say where they all are or can you lose track of people? That's, um, a bit of a tricky one. That's what I'm sort of struggling with at the moment. It, it depends on who your point of view character is and what they're paying attention to. So that's how I yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, if you're either close third or um, first person, I don't write an omniscient typically. Um, so it's who they're paying attention to. And they may see someone, you know, in the background, maybe someone they're interested in mm. um, romantically they're probably paying a lot of attention to them um, or uh, you know whoever they're talking to and interacting with they're going to pay attention to and what and other characters that drift off they're just going to kind of forget about. Off, Before off, I call on you Sharice I want to get Kim in there. Just, just uh, as Ted was saying you know uh, I've been to 28 years of diplomat any number of receptions and some of the receptions were you know 50 to 100 people and you know, you talk to the people you talk to, you look around to see who you know, and everybody else who you don't know, they're, they're, they're you know, they're essentially wallpaper. Mm. Um, but they're, you know, they're there to tell you how grandiose or whatever it is, but you don't keep track of them, right. you know, because you're not interested in them. Mm. That's the thing, you, you keep track of the people you're interested in. Therese. If they have a name, then I just have to say, so-and-so was in the corner drunk all night. If I don't want to talk <laughs> about that, if they don't, but the easiest way to get 20 people into a room and not have to comment is don't give them a name. <laughs> then it's that group over there. Yeah. Guard number one, guard number two. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the next question for the panel, how do you create sidekicks and antagonists? Um, that's just like um, creating other any other character, except they have a specific role in, in the plot. So the purpose of the antagonist is to um, oppose the goals of the protagonist. So they have a sort of specific role. And then sidekicks, their role is to help the protagonist. So, but other than that, they can have, they should be three dimensional characters and not just be created to, um, advance the plot. And uh, I would say that about any major or minor character, again, like bit players where they're like just there to serve tea or something that doesn't matter so much. Uh, but um, they should all seem real no matter what the role in the story is and they should seem complex. But their goals, the goals of the story goals of those characters either should be aligned with the protagonist or opposed to the protagonist. So that's, in my view, that's really the only major difference. Um, when Writing from the writer's viewpoint, there's two ways to write in third person. One of them is to be inside the head of the point of view person and saying that he thought that this would work. Um, or he was, he was remembering 
and we're seeing inside the, the person's head. But another way to write is this, like you're watching a movie without voiceover, um, all you see is the externalities. And so if you want to see what's in the protagonist's head, he discusses it with his sidekicks. He says, tomorrow we're going to go do this because I need to find out this information, as opposed to you know, us seeing it in italics. You know, the protagonist is thinking, I have to go do this. So the sidekicks are people that you can talk to and that there's a reason for the protagonist to talk to, to move the plot along. And, and because of the relationship, and again, there, as Ted said, and as everybody else has said for that matter, they have to have their own personality and their own role, which is why the protagonist talks to them, or the sidekick asks a question that the protagonist then has to answer. So again, you don't have, you're, you're, in that regard, you are showing the reader rather than telling him that information because you have that relationship going on. I will quite often have some problems that it seems like there's no possible way the protagonist um, can solve it. And so I will put them in a sort of, sort of sit them down with the other major characters that are, are um, like, like their sidekicks or so forth. They're, or they may not be sidekicks, but they're working together and they all hash out how to solve it. Very little of this will actually end up on the page, but, but some of it will. Some of it will. Uh, and that's sort of a way to both make, uh, it's kind of a realistic way of how um, you know, a group of people would solve a problem. And that kind of um, accomplishes two goals. It both comes up with a way for them to solve the problem and then brings the characters along. Karen. Includes conflict too. Mm. Now, I, I um, would agree with everything that you guys have just said. Um, I've got my first drafts are quite often my side sidekicks are often just someone. Someone says this or someone does that. Um, and then I realise in the second draft whether or not that someone is going to be important enough to stay in the story. Um, so I find that interesting. They kind of play the role, they play the role of that me telling myself what the story is going to be um, without really having to think it through. And then when I work through through the next stage, I start to decide whether or not they deserve a name or not. And if they don't, then that bit gets, gets kicked out. So, yeah, the mind kind of grow um, organically sometimes like that. Cherise. I realise that I don't do a lot of sidekicks um, in my stories. And I think that's because I... In general, they never really have their own agency. So I'm trying to think of a sidekick that I, like was done well, but in my own writing, I, I prefer the interaction with folks. But if you're gonna do a sidekick, I think it's what everybody, I don't have anything else to add. It's expert advice. <laughs> not, well, not sidekick, but you know, other member of the group, if it's a group going together. Your sidekick isn't necessarily a secondary, you know, it's not Robin to Batman. It's, you know, when you say sidekick, you can be, you know, everybody is, you know, in the, in the Lord of the Rings and that, uh, in the group, they're essentially, they're all equal characters, but they have interaction. So, I mean, yeah. it doesn't have to necessarily be a, you know, tag along person. So do you have people that mm -hmm. travel in groups or is it their sister or their mother that they yeah, regularly yeah. interact with? I think uh, you're right, Kim. I think about it like that. Um, you know, I would never think of Samwise as a side character. He has yeah. his no, own journey. Yeah. And I, I, Yes, I tend to lean toward the meteor, but you're right. It really is just people traveling together and how they interact. And as I said, we've all, everybody's said great things about that, so. And um, my, one of my favorite movies is Sky High where the sidekicks are hero support and are really main characters. And the main character ends up learning about himself by being a sidekick. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I thought that was a great play on the whole sidekick part of being a hero. Mm -hmm. So my next question is, um, in terms of we've been touching on more memorable characters, how do you make a, a memorable one off? What, what do you do to make some, you know, so, someone who just comes in and goes out, but they were so memorable in the story? Um, I don't know about necessarily Again, there, there are characters who are like that, but also using um, using uh, one appearance, even one paragraph characters to build the scenery. Um, I've been thinking about this and I think, you know, you say Marlebert walks into the market and it's thrustling, it's thriving, hustling, bustling and all sort of stuff. 
and that's telling. So Marlebert walks into, you know, a couple of paces into the market and he's jostled on one side by a woman carrying a large basket of fruit. Um, and a moment later, he's shoved roughly to one side by a fellow who goes by him in the livery of the Duke's uh, messenger service covered in dust. Um, and what we've done, I mean, for example, the woman with a basket of fruit, is she carrying a basket of apples? Then you're in a sort of a Northern Europe environment. Is it a basket of oranges, lemons, or grapes? Then maybe your environment is Mediterranean. If she's carrying a basket of bananas or plantains, you've set the environment of the market as something tropical. And the fact that a ducal messenger has gone by um, tells us that the governmental structure includes the duke and maybe a king above that. And uh, it might even be foreshadowing the fact that, you know, Marlebert is looking for a job as a guard and the messenger is bringing a message of urgency that means the Duke is going to be hiring a lot of guards all of a sudden. You know, and so you do a bit of, and so even though they're, they're just, they're part of the picture showing, you know, Marlebert's being pushed back and forth, trying to make his way through the crowd. It shows you the density of the crowd. I mean, the persons weren't able to get around him. They actually had to bump into him trying to get past. So that shows the reader that you've got a throng in the marketplace. And again, you can use things like the messenger hustling by um, to foreshadow. And again, what the lady has in her basket um, paints you a picture of what part of the world you're in. So again, you can use them, use, use, you can, I hate to say this, but you can use one shot people's appearances as scenery builders. You can also use um, bit uh, characters to uh, build character for your point of view character. For example, they'll notice something about that character that strikes them and in doing so you both have a um, a bit character that stands out but more important you also bring up some knowledge about um, your major character whose uh, point of view it is for example um, I don't want to say it's someone who is very your character is very fastidious say this character is obviously unwashed or smelly and the odor from that character's clothes makes the um, point of view's character's nostrils quiver or something like that or maybe um, the, this uh, maybe it's a female character in this um, uh, it's, she's talking to some male character who's like eyeing her up and down and she kind of gets creeped out. So things like that. Mm. Now, I think that a little bit of a twist to that question, which I think is, I'm going to argue and say we can't necessarily do that, is making them memorable. Like what, both of those examples you've given are absolutely brilliant. That's exactly what we do in writing is building background. But whether or not those little tiny characters are memorable, they probably shouldn't be memorable. Mm. They really should be almost not noticeable. You know, it's a bit like, um, I think it's a bit like lighting in film or sometimes even music in film. If we see, if we notice the lighting, then someone's done a really bad job. And in a way, both of what you've described there um, is the lighting. Like, we shouldn't even really notice those little teeny characters. So, in fact, I think they probably shouldn't be memorable quite often. Those little teeny background ones, we shouldn't even notice them in some ways. They should seem, you know, should just be in the background there. Um, and it's building in our minds, but we don't notice they're there. So, I'm going to say I don't think we should make them memorable. Not, not every single character, if you're going to be in a place where there's lots of people. Yeah, not the tiny ones. Like if we're talking about tiny little bit characters, they don't necessarily, they, they, they need to be there as background, but maybe we shouldn't always be um, even really noticing them. So much. I, I do like to have if they're, if the character is interacting with the point of view character, um, oh, that yeah. point of view character should notice something about them. It's not like they're some voice from the void is, is you know, saying something to them because, you know, we pick up on um, who we're, speaking to we pick up information about their uh their their face and their body and their clothes mm. and, and so forth i'm gonna Three. say I, okay so from a bit story i mean a bit character point i like to have them do something that's like a an easter egg or a clue that you can follow later mm. so you see so the duke coming by and that's a clue about something else that you will need to pay attention because I'm that kind of reader. I love like when all the details matter and then I'm like, oh, I knew I figured that out. So I like to do that. But I'm going to talk about that memorable one character from a purely selfish writer standpoint. I like to use my one-off characters to infuse, like release the tension that I have. So if it's been serious and horrible, my one-off character is going to be totally crazy and humorous. And that gives, and so I love that. And in that way I can put like, 
everything that I can't put anywhere else, I can put into that one sort of one-off character. And um, mm. I really enjoy that. It's so much fun. It gives me sort of the release I need. If I'm writing mm. something really funny, I can be serious or serious, I can be funny. And it's a really fun part of the, um, the writing process for me. Mm. So I'd like to go to some of the questions from the Q&A. The first of which is, how do you make your character someone your reader will really care about and will want to read more about? Uh, well, that kind of goes back to um, our first question where I was talking about um, memorable characters, um, having your character. So the reader will care about the character if the character cares about something and it's something relatable to the reader. Mm -hmm. um, so your character should be uh, passionate um, about something. Um, you want to, basically in fiction, you want to engage the emotions of the reader. And, um, and the way to do that typically is through the, the characters, the protagonist and your other point of view characters. Um, another way, um, again, is, you know, have something in their past that's affecting them in the present and um, some arc that they need to realize, uh, whether they be um, the protagonist or some other uh, major character that is uh, found throughout the story. Um, they should have some inner conflict uh, that they need to get through to um, reach their story goals. And then things like if they're resourceful or courageous or fighting for a lost cause, those sorts of things um, make the reader, uh, help a reader root for that character because they uh, kind of identify with them. They, they identify or recognize positive traits that uh, they would, so they would like to see that character succeed. Now, as a reader, I will pick up most books and read them all the way through to the end. Okay, I do. But there was one particular book that I couldn't get more than about a third of the way through, even forcing myself. And I, it was the first of an entire series, and I never read any of the rest of them, never touched any of the rest of them. And I'm not going to name it. But um, when the, Lord of the, the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings came out in the paperback editions and became very popular, then of course, as you know, the publishing houses go, oh, this sells. So what else have we got out there? and immediately began pumping out a lot of imitations or derivatives and whatnot. And in, in this one, we have the questing group and the Gandalf figure is supercilious and arrogant and he's impatient with the ignorance of the other people and puts them down. The, uh, the prototype protege character is whiny and needy and none of the rest of the group as they pick them up are people that I liked at all. Yeah, they should be likable in some way. In some Nobody way, and maybe, likes and maybe, character. maybe by the end of the story, and maybe by the end of the arc, and the problem was the book was, you know, the paperback was that thick. Maybe by the end of the, the arc, we would have seen development. But I didn't see that in the beginning. There wasn't anything for me to pick up on these people. And I finally said, you know what, I, there are better things for me to read. Hmm. And so, so that, that, that's, the, that's the flip side of what Ted was saying, okay? And that, you know, there, 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 there's got to be some way, you know, would I be this Gandalf, the, this leader character? No. Would I be this follower character? No. Would I be this side character this group? No. I can't imagine myself being part of that group. There you go. I can't imagine putting myself into a relationship with any of these people, and particularly not in this toxic group they're in. So uh, there's got to be something that's non-toxic for the people to connect to. The reader. Yeah, real characters should have, um, will have some negative and some positive traits. Oh, yeah. it's, it's important when you introduce the characters or like in the first, I don't know, first scene or two, have something um, good about them. Some, even if it's a small glimmer, um, don't have them completely um, re repugnant and repellent. Obnoxious. Yes, um, even your antagonist should have something um, mm -hmm. good about them. Or something, Karen, something not repellent. 
You've had your hand up. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to say, at, at a kind of a very base level, one of my tricks is to engage the senses. So make people feel the same things that that That's character true. might feel, even if it's by, by uh, describing the smell of something rotting, like rotting meat when you open up the fridge, or the taste of a fresh apple, or, um, you know, the smell of rain on the footpath. Things like that that the reader can relate to themselves and therefore feel a connection to... Um, to the character. You know, when someone's telling you a story and I say, oh, and I saw this dog and he'd been out in the rain and oh God, he stank or whatever. And you go, oh yeah, yeah, I know, I know what that's like. And you feel an instant um, rapport and a connection um, with that person who's telling the story. Therese. Um, I'm going to add, I agree with everything everyone said. I also wanted to add, it's not, because I've read, I remember reading a fantastic story and I did not like the main character at all but I love the world that they were in. So even if you're writing a, an unlikable character, there's got to be something interesting about the situation they're in. So if you're writing a character that's awful, give the reader a hint fairly early on that someone is going to kill them and you're gonna be happy about that. <laughs> Why well, think about, when, you know, think about when um, Joffrey died. I mean, literally it was just like, I mean, I <laughs> celebrated that day. Yes, it was so, I mean, I was, sorry, spoiler. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah. I know right it's not a spoiler. But um, I wanted to say some other things. If you're still, you know, they talk about that first page. You've got to grab your reader with that first page. And sometimes it's hard to get, often, most times, it's hard to get all the character on that first page. So here mm. are a couple of things that you might think about. Curiosity. You know, in how you start the story, how you introduce the characters, are you creating a situation that might make the reader ask a question that they then want the answer to? And that's how you keep going until you find out that their mom died and they care and all that. You know, just think about how you can make that first situation, how you can create tension that creates curiosity. Everyone, we already talked about emotion, getting getting them to feel not necessarily like a tragic emotion, but like Karen was saying, that they, you're highlighting an experience that they can relate to very early mm -hmm. on. And then con start conflict or action at the beginning. You know, you open the book with, I keep talking about people dying, so I guess that says something <laughs> about me. But, you know, uh, is your first scene like a murder scene where it's like, oh my gosh, I can't, I just opened up and this crazy thing happened. Um, that's another way to get your reader going. And then um, finally, the fascinating situation. Is it a world where, you, you know, you, where it's just completely unique and different and you're highlighting something about the world that will grab that reader and then bring them onto the journey that you want? Mm -hmm. So those are just some things. So this brings up a good point about um, be dribbling in important and relevant backstory of the characters and like revelations into the characters why they are the way they are and um why it's such a problem that they might need to overcome but but dribbling it in making it a mystery because people are naturally drawn to follow mysteries so another question for the q a which seems to come out of what Cerisi was saying because i'm thinking <laughs> of joffrey is how do you feel about writing a name character for the sole purpose of killing them <laughs> which seems to be a very big thing for JR, uh, to, for Martin. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, oh, Karen. You have to care. Killing someone I don't care about gets you nowhere. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have an emotional impact unless you care about that character right. who so died. Unless it's, some, unless it's some character who's so repugnant, like Sri said about Joffrey Baratheon, where you want them and you can't wait for them to be killed. But I knew why I wanted him to be killed. Even yeah. then, yeah, I yes. cared. Yeah. 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 My uh, sister wrote me an angry email um, reading through my novel going, you killed off my hairy wolf man. <laughs> he, was, he was an alien of a, of, a, of a furry sort who was a poet as well. He was a sidekick uh, to the hero. And they got into a fight. And in that case, killing him off. You know, and, he, very, and his buddy. They're both very sympathetic characters, you know, supportive of the hero. But, you know, in, 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 when you look at comic book franchises, you look at the Avengers or the Fantastic Four, you know, there's never something so catastrophic that it becomes the Fantastic Three or the Fantastic Two after that. I mean, everybody, all of the protagonists, all of them survive all of the time. And if I kill off 
you know, and I kill off bad guys too. Uh, you know, this is a, a fairly lawless world that our hero has fallen into. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of organized crime. But if I kill off a sympathetic character, it's because I want to show that this situation was life or death. That it's not something that the hero, you know, he was Superman. He waltzed in, waltzed out, you know, bullets bounced off and whatnot. Now, if somebody gets killed, that means the hero could have been killed too. Mm -hmm. And it really was a serious situation. And, you know, it, it makes it, I think, more real for the readers if somebody is killed or injured, as opposed to waltzing invulnerably through all situations. I mean, that's unrealistic. That's, a, that's, what's so brilliant about, um, that's what's so brilliant about Game of Thrones is that um, obviously Ned Stark is the hero of the series at first, and then, um, spoiler, he, he dies. And it's because of... Um, mistakes that he made um, relevant to the um, dangerous, awful, scheming world that he's in that he um, is, you know, too good for, basically. And that's a point that Martin is making about this world is that nobody's safe because um, people are just so wretched. I mean, they're, or they're so power hungry uh, that these sorts of things happen. And that's what happened in the medieval world. Um, you know, it's very dangerous. Yeah, you don't you don't want your protagonist to always be safe. You want no, to you want to be able to you want to be able to show the 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 audience that, golly, he really was in danger. Okay. Anyone else want to touch that before uh, we hit the five minute warning? Aaron, our tech is saying four minute warning. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to do uh, final thoughts. And I'm not rushing everyone, you know, take your time because I don't want to be finished in one minute. <laughs> so final thoughts, where can we find you? Something else you want to tell us? Kim, you want to go first? Sure. Um, a story is a narrative. And a narrative, unless you're writing a geology text, you know, about the development of volcanoes or whatnot, a narrative involves characters. And uh, as a writer, they're not throwaways. They're critical. They're crucial. They move. I mean, they're, you know, the, the rocks and the, and the grass on the lawn and whatnot, they're not going to move the story along. The characters are going to move the story along and you have to put thought into them. Okay. I'm going to add the characters are where you get to have fun. I mean, I, I am the, uh, the first audience for anything I write. I want to know how it ends. I want to know what happens. It's a privilege to walk with these characters. They've told you their story. If you're listening if, and, you, and they can trust you and you have empathy for them, even the worst character, you have empathy and understanding of their background. If you've taken the time to ask them, why are you so awful? Or are, why are you so kind? Why are you, you know, whatever it is. If you've taken that time to ask those questions and you get those answers, that's a privilege. Writing changes you. You know, and so at least it's changed me um, with all the different characters that I've written and the, you know, as a reader that I've read. So enjoy that revel in getting to know these people that have taken up your time and your head and won't let you sleep. And because in that, the more you can enjoy that, the more you can express that. It's never a waste of time, even if it doesn't get on the page, because I promise you, the work that you do, if it's not there in words, you, you know how you can sense something when you read it? And you're, and the, you're like, how did you know that? Well, I felt it. All of that comes in because you as a writer took that time with your characters. So have fun it, with them and get it, to know them. It, I find that- the, Kim, the, Kim <laughs> we're in final thoughts. I've got to give everyone okay. else final thoughts. Mm -hmm. Karen. All right, all right. Um, I just have one short one. Um, um, oh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Aaron first. Here you go. <laughs> Maybe I'll guess yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to hard to add on top of what we're saying. I really love stories you're talking about. Uh, how much fun it is. And I write mostly horror, so I am not writing likeable characters most of the time. Um, but they do have to be completely intriguing and 
you absolutely want to know what happens to them or what they're going to do next. And um, I have to decide whether or not I'm going to name victims or not, because naming a victim changes the absolute nature of the story. Um, it changes it from being anonymous, those victims being anonymous and unimportant, and my murderer is the most important thing, to, to those victims actually being far more important. Um, so I love that opportunity to tell uh, the little stories of people who would otherwise be forgotten, I guess, is one of the reasons why I'm a writer. I was talking to somebody today about um, sitting sitting around having a cup of coffee and she said we, we've got a terrible domestic violence problem in Australia as many people do around the world and we were just talking about how awful it is and she said to me oh there's a horror story for you you should write a story about that and I'm oh my god woman you know for, since I was 14 years old I've been writing stories about that and you've bought books of mine that are about that um, and that was infuriating so I love the chance to be able to tell those stories tell try and understand and tell the stories of people who don't otherwise have a voice. So I guess in the 10 seconds um, I have left, um, so um, characters are the story. The plot and the world building is an important part of the story, but the characters are how the reader makes an emotional connection to the stories, to the, the characters. So make sure that they, if, as if you're a writer, make sure that your characters are real, they're engaging, um, and uh, that they have emotional resonance and that they have agency. Um, uh, again, um, my name is Ted Weber. Uh, first two books, my near future cyberpunk trilogies, uh, Safe State Interrupt and Rapid Leviathan are out. The finale will come out September 1st. Um, you can find me at tcweber.com and I will post a link in the website to um, the uh, character sheets and uh, information on developing characters that I was talking about at the beginning of, of uh, this panel. And I'm DA Chair and just want to share that when your character does something you don't expect, you've done them right. Yep. Um, you can find me on dhair.net. Some of us will be on Discord to follow up on this panel. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. It was fun. That was, it was fun. Great. That was a nice panel. Thank that was you. great. I really, I love what you guys had to say. Yeah, you guys too. It was awesome. really good. It's Very inspiring. Actually, actually, I, 